Hey guys, it's Daniel. Welcome back. The following is my interview with guitarist Blackbird McKnight, where he discusses his history with Parliament Funkadelic, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Miles Davis, his thoughts on Jimi Hendrix, and much more. So how did you end up joining Parliament Funk? Okay, uh, this is a good one. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure where I met this gentleman, but the first guy that I met from P-Funk was Ron Brembry. Okay. And he play, he plays guitar. He is uh, not with us. He uh, transcended uh, about a couple of years ago. Hmm. And uh, he played guitar. Back at that time, I would just, if I heard a guitar playing when I was walking through a neighborhood or something, I'd go knock on the door. That's cool. And say, hey, what kind of guitar is that? Hey, you sound good. Blah, 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 blah. And this guy was very friendly. So he had me come in the house. And uh, he played, he played his guitar. He gave it to me and he let me play his guitar. He said, wow, you, you're pretty good. <laughs> and we struck up a friendship. And that went on for about a couple of years. Unbeknownst to me, he knew Archie Ivey, who was the president of Thang Incorporated, which is the management for, Parli for Parliament Funkadelic. Mm -hmm. He is a bass player. <laughs> Finally, one day we went over to Archie's house and we played. After the jam, you know, we talked and, and chopped it up. And uh, he said that they're starting a group. I don't know if you're into this or not, but in about a year or so from now, we're going to start a group and we might be giving you a call to uh, come and, and audition hmm. for us. However long it was, I forgot about it. I was like, yeah, sure. Okay, <laughs> fine. <yeah, all> right. <laughs> and then that leads us up to the phone call that I got. I was at home one afternoon, lived in Hollywood, and I got a call on the phone around 4.45. People from, from George Clinton's office. Okay. And they called and they said, what are you doing at home? You, you're supposed to be at the airport. I'm like, hello, who is this? <laughs> I was like, this is this is uh, Fang Incorporated. We're in Hollywood, and, and you're supposed to be at a flight. We have a flight booked for you at 5 o'clock. I said, well, it's 4.45 now. <laughs> I ain't going to make no 5 o'clock flight. Yeah. So they just randomly called you, no heads up. They just expected you to still remember for the conversation? Yes. <laughs> and I'm not the only one that happened to. <laughs> so uh, they booked me a flight at 11 o'clock. Okay. And I took the red eye to Detroit and made an audition for a group, The Brides of Dr. Funkenstein. Cool. Made that audition, played with them for about a year or so. And after that, they were getting to the point where they were breaking up. Hmm. And so I went to George and I asked George, um, well, I think these guys are breaking up, so I want to stay. <laughs> and th that was that. That was that. So, you know, listening to the Red Hot Chili Peppers, especially their early stuff, there's a very clear Parliament Funk influence on them. When you first heard the Chili Peppers, what was your, what did you think of them as a band? Electricity. Hmm. Sheer electricity, uh, high energy, just zany, rocking, good feeling, high energy rock and roll. That's what I got from it. You were a member of the Red Hot Chili Peppers for a period of time in 1988. What exactly is the story there? Well, after Hillel passed, I'm not sure how many days or how how long the it was before they called, but I got a call from free uh, from Flea asking if I wanted to come and join the band, and I said yes. So it, it was as simple as that. After Hillel passed, uh, they they rang me and. Mm. I came into the fold. Did you have a relationship with Hillel at all? No, actually, no. Hmm. Interesting. He was probably the last one of them. He and Anthony was the last one of the of the group that I met. So when you actually joined the band, was it meant to be a temporary thing from the get go or what exactly happened? I would like to think that it was something to bridge the gap while they were looking for someone to fill that spot after Hillel passed. There were like three or four gigs that they did. And uh, they finally settled on Mr. Frusante. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what they were thinking. 
I, I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know if they wanted to have me as a full time or, or or what. Um, so I I don't know. Hmm. I, I I don't know. That's fair enough. I saw Flea also at a, a Living Color concert. Really, that's cool. Yeah, this was like a little bit after uh, they got Frusante. We sat at a table all night talking about what had happened in the band. We totally missed Living Color. <laughs> like, that's funny. By the time we got through talking, it was like, hey, the music, they, they stopped playing. <laughs> we, we talked through this whole concert and yeah, so. What is Flea like as a person to hang out with? Very, very cool. Hmm. They all are very, very cool. We used to come to, if I'm not mistaken, Flea used to come to my house and we used to jam in my garage when I had a place over in uh, in South Los Angeles. Hmm. And like I said, we both played in a band, Trudio Disgracious. So we were in contact with each other quite a bit before um i got in the band interesting so your longtime parliament bandmate george clinton produced the chili peppers freaky styly album in 1985 at the time were you aware of the george clinton chili peppers connection when did you first meet the chili peppers i'm trying to remember where i met flea hmm. uh i think it was with the group that we had uh trulio disgracious norwood's band hmm. and i probably met flea and uh, Cliff Martinez, the drummer, then. Mm -hmm. So I was hanging out a lot with them and talking to them. I had no idea that George was going to do a uh, the record mm -hmm. with them, the Freaky Study record, mm -hmm. until later, uh, until later on. I'm like, wow, like cool. I, I like these guys, you know. Mm -hmm. I walked into the crib his uh, his house one night, and they were in his living room. I sat up. That's cool. It was Cliff. Hillel, Anthony, and Flea. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So, I mean, is there anything in particular about your time with the Chili Peppers you would like people to know? Um, I had fun. <laughs> that That's about all. That was a flash in the pan. That was like four gigs and I was out. So mm. I had a blast. You know, we just did a tour with them in 2019. And uh, I got to play with them uh, on a show. So oh. we're good. We're cool. We're all, we're all cool. That's cool. What was that like for you? That was great. Are you kidding? <laughs> that whole that whole tour was a great experience. Going out there and seeing all of those people, and watching the way they reacted to the band, to Funkadelic, which is one of their favorite bands. And you don't know if the audience is going to take to you or not. But we came out rocking uh, Super Stupid and mm -hmm. a couple of uh, Butt to Butt Resuscitation, some of those hard rocking songs, and crowd went nuts. So. Hard to get unhappy after that. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So, I mean, after things ended with the Peppers, did you keep in touch with them at all prior to 2019? I saw Flea in a couple of spots. We did maybe a gig or two of them. That's cool. So I wanted to ask you about Jimi Hendrix. As you mentioned to me before, he's a big influence of yours. In your opinion, why is Hendrix so important and still relevant today? For me, because... Everything that Hendrix did was so cool and fresh. Like I'd never heard anything like that before. And I heard of a, a lot. I heard a lot of guitar players, but to me, Hendrix was Hendrix's music was very, very special, very cool. Not to mention his guitar playing was mm -hmm. off the charts. <laughs> yeah, just his fluidity and the message that he sent with with his notes the way he grew up the way you would hear how he grew up you know as opposed to everyone else it was just different it was just different he stood out amongst all of those other players mm -hmm. to me to me yeah for sure so i mean musicians often talk a lot about feel how having a good feel is more important oftentimes than being good technically one of the cool yeah. things about hendrix to me is that he had both he had really amazing feel and he was really good technically so yeah, for you personally, when it comes to like, I'm not sure if you ever got to see Hendrix live, but when you look at videos of Hendrix or when you listen to his music, oh, cool. Or when you see him live, what is that experience like for you as an artist, like admiring him four times? I saw Hendrix four times. That's so cool. I seen him at the Anaheim Convention Center, the Forum twice and the Hollywood Bowl. And he took the blues to a different level. 
his legato, his legato playing when at that time <laughs> we call playing legato ghost notes. Mm. I think we called it ghost notes or something when you don't pick. And Hendrix played that. He played legato. He didn't pick every note. Mm. But he maybe picked every other note. In fact, his style to me is so hard to still to to pick out because I I had to delve into my own. I I couldn't copy him. I wish I I wish like hell I could. <laughs> yeah, his legato playing, just the note, the choice of notes that he played, the fact that his band had a rock feel, a jazz feel, or anything else that he might have wanted to explore at the time they went to places that a lot of other bands i feel did not go hendrix just had that extra something that that drew you in it it drew me in and made me listen and the way his licks were so fluid that just kept me in awe yeah for sure you know, when you listen to his records, I mean, you can hear there the music is phenomenal. But when I'm seeing the videos of him and he's like, he's doing the splits with the guitar or he's licking the guitar or he's doing all this crazy stuff, it just enhances it. Yeah, like I said, I've never seen anything like like the guy ever in my life. I, I've never seen that type of fluidity and, and expression in anyone's playing mm -hmm. as I did his. He's such an amazing guitar player, but he also has a great voice. But because mm. he's so good at playing, I feel like people kind of overlook the voice. In your view, what do you think about his voice specifically? I loved his voice because his voice went exactly with what he was doing. You know what I mean? His songs and his mm -hmm. voice were, if they'd have got anybody else to sing anything, I, I don't know if it would have went over the same way. Because it's, it seems like he knew exactly what he wanted to do with 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 his gift so when he bought it to us he bought it to us and it seemed like he worked relentlessly i mean i'd see notepads and stuff of him uh mm. writing his lyrics down and stuff so he was always working he was he was always working so that lays a, a big part of him getting his message across as well you know with a guy like hendrix from what i understand he wasn't like i guess technically or classically trained as a singer he just kind of knew how to do it so to speak when people aren't actually trained and they just kind of know it naturally, does, does that add a quality that wouldn't be there if they were trained, so to speak? Does that make sense, the question? Yeah, it, it depends upon how intimidated you are about your voice, I <laughs> guess. I think that maybe he did not care. He knew that he wanted to project this message and he was going to do it the way he was going to do it. He didn't care. I, I think one of his idols was Bob Dylan, who hmm. was saying, like, Maybe not the greatest voice, but boy, could he tell a story. <laughs> For you, what is the coolest thing about Hendrix? Like, what is the one thing that you love about the guy the most? Everything about that brother was mm -hmm. just iconic. Like, I never heard from anyone else during that period. He had, without a doubt, the coolest music that I heard. And everybody had, you know, a lot of people had great music at that time, but just his was different. And it, to me was on time mm -hmm. he was simply on time like the, the times needed him is that what you're is that what you're saying oh yes we did mm -hmm. yeah his style his music his voice the accolades that he accumulated on the guitar i loved everything about hendrix what did you think of his star spangled banner performance at woodstock loved it mm -hmm. loved it loved it every time he played it if you had to compare Woodstock and Monterey, which is the more influential concert in your view when it came to Hendrix specifically? Oh, wow. Because you have two totally different periods. Look what he was with the theatrics and, and the newness of what he was doing as opposed to the latter uh, um, Woodstock where he had come into his own and he would just stand there and play the guitar and entertain. It got beyond his little uh, trio. You know, he had a big band, and he was sharing his spotlight a lot more. It, it just was, and the performance, The we got this little snippet of Woodstock when the first Woodstock album came out, and that was one of the most incredible pieces of guitar work mm -hmm. that I had heard. Just the end of Purple Haze, I think it is. Mm -hmm. 
the end, at the end of Purple Haze going into a new in the land of the new rising sun, I think it is. That's cool. And he just ended with that. So, I mean, in your view, what is Hendrix's most iconic performance? Would it be Woodstock or Monterey Pop or Isle of Wight? I mean, there's so many amazing shows. What do you think was his greatest performance? The second, for me, the second time at the Forum, I think in 1970, 69 or 70, that was the most mind-blowing thing I show I ever, I ever seen to this day. And I hear tapes of it. Uh, you hear the little bootlegs and stuff, and I listen to it, and I think, yeah, I was hearing what I was hearing, and I was right on. I was I was spot on because it still it still registers to this day that he was he was messing with some bad shit. Huh. <laughs> he was bad man. <laughs> what was he doing in particular that night that really stood out to you? Like, what was it specifically? Okay, what he didn't do was the visuals, but it was the way that he was playing the guitar. He was happy. You could tell that he was happy. He was entertaining. He didn't do a lot of visuals. He did do some. So after about the second or third song, I would always see what he was wearing. He was always sharp, of course. And after that, I would kind of close my eyes and just listen to what he was playing. And he just went out to the stratosphere, bro. He went out <laughs> and he bought some shit back with it like I, that's yeah. awesome is there any one song of his that sticks out to you impromptu question <laughs> unfair i saw it man i just just thought of it now <laughs> you know it's like which album do you like oh so unfair but like you know because we have choices we we have we don't have to like just one thing but um i'm gonna say uh for now I'm going to just throw a couple out there. Um, Stars to play with Laughing Sam's Dice. Cool. That shit was so cool. Then you got Voodoo Child. Manic Depression was probably my favorite solo because it was so fat. I thought it was like two people playing. Hmm. When I I first heard it, I was like, can't one person can can do that. He did it. (laughs) (laughs) He, He did it. But those, those are some of my favorites. I, there's so much of his stuff that is just my my all-time favorite. It's hard to pick just one. Yeah, I it's hear you. Hard. Hey, man, that's cool. That's a great answer, you know? When you perform, are you trying to channel Jimmy at all? Like, is he, is he a conscious influence on your performance? I would have to say yes. But I try to bring in my own flavor mm-hmm. because... A friend of mine put it this way one time. Well, dude, when you get to where you're going in the in the music industry, what is it you want to be known for? Do you want to be known for being you, or do you want to be known for playing like someone else? Mm. I was like, ooh, okay. So yes, I do. I channel probably a lot of people because I have a lot of favorites. Him being my favorite, but. There are a lot of people I channel, but spontaneous when I'm playing because it's never the same. The audience is never the same. Mm-hmm. So I change with whatever environment that I'm in from night to night. When were you first made aware of Hendrix as a musician? When did you first hear of him? I saw him before I heard him. Wow. I was in a barber shop <laughs> getting my hair cut like a spring chicken. <laughs> and uh, and these, this guy... Um, had a, had a, a magazine rack and there was Look Magazine and it was a story about the Monterey Pop Festival. Okay. And so I picked that up and I was flipping through the pictures of the Monterey Pop Festival. That shit blew me away, bro. That shit was like that whole hippie scene or whatever you want to call yeah. it, the rock and roll scene at that time. And I was looking Crosby, Stills, Nash, Brian Jones and Otis Redding and The Who and, and everybody and I came to this picture in about the middle of the magazine. I don't know where it was, but this guy was playing guitar on his on the floor with his hand over his eyes. So he must have been playing with one hand. That's sick. Yeah. And I took one look at that and I flipped another couple of pictures and I was like, I thought it was Little Richard. I didn't know Little <laughs> Richard played guitar. So, you know, I looked, okay, who is this? Jimi Hendrix. So I said, okay, let me remember this name. And a little bit after that, I was listening to the radio. Mm-hmm. And 
three KHJ, I think, was the first time I heard Foxy Lady hmm. on the radio. Blew my mind. And I, okay, before they said it was the Jimi Hendrix experience, I heard the song. And I was like, that's that's probably that dude that was in the magazine playing on his back. That's sick. And so we didn't have the internet and all of that stuff at that time. Yeah, so yeah. I had to go to the, the corner store and get through all of the cream magazines and everything I could find. And I said, okay, that's him. That's, that's, that's the guy. And that, that is how I discovered Hendrix in a barbershop <laughs> flipping through magazines. That's so sick. <laughs> <laughs> can I, can I get my hair like this? Oh, Hell no, Stevie. <laughs> That's awesome, man. So you did some work with Miles Davis. What's Miles Davis like? Miles Davis is very direct, uh, very cool to me. He was very cool to me. He'll call you up in the morning and say, uh, you know, that fuzzy sound you was using on your guitar last night, don't use it so much tonight, okay? <laughs> that was Miles. <laughs> That's awesome. What, 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 what happened on that blues song last night? Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> that was my. That is awesome. <laughs> but he was the coolest dude. He was one of the coolest dudes I met. That's so cool. How'd you end up working with him? I think Dennis Chambers was the guy that did that. He had a tape of a P Funk show, I guess, and he was sitting with Miles. And Miles asked him who was on the tape. Mm -hmm. And there were two guitar players at that time. It was Michael Hampton and myself that were doing the leads. And uh, Dennis said he was either Mike or Bird. And I got the call. And so what exactly did you work on with him? I did uh, four shows at the, uni at the then Universal Amphitheater in, uh, somewhere in the Valley. And what year was this, do you remember? I want to say 86, the winter of 86, or maybe 87. So, I mean, this might be kind of a an odd question, but how would you compare Miles Davis to George Clinton? Is there anything similar or different about them? Everything is similar. But see, that's what, that is the difference about me and my playing, which by the time I heard John Coltrane, and you know, Jimmy had just passed away. Hmm. So I had gravitated to other things like uh, Miles, who is Miles um, Train, Cannonball. And you, you remember also that Miles Train and Cannonball were pretty much in my life, through my life, because my dad had those records. So I was listening to those records and still remember a lot of those solos um, up there. Mm -hmm. So I, I got as much of that as I possibly could. And when I went to the brides, if you listen to any of those bride songs, I wasn't playing Hendrix licks. I was, I was out there. I was like totally out there. That's and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to bridge those two musics together so i didn't see any difference in p-funk um and ja jazz and p-funk or anything else that that matter like whatever you have if you can bring it to the table and people like what you do then whether they get it or not and like it i did my job and I, I can honestly say that more times than others, by the time I got through doing my little solo or whatever it were, uh, got a pretty good ovation, so. That's cool. So going back to George Clinton for a moment, how is he like as an artist to collaborate and work with? The cool, the another very cool, probably the coolest dude I know. Hmm. Coolest, funkiest guy I know. Um. <clears throat> Can be easy to work, but can be hard to work. It depends upon how hard you make it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he's very cool to work with. Very good with a big group of people. Knows how to entertain and can hear anything on the stage. Like 
like Miles did. It's, it's funny about these guys. And he'll be on stage and the other couple of nights later, he'll tell you he liked this solo or he liked this part of something or whatever, or a lick that you were doing. And like, there's four or five guitar players on and say, how could you pick that out, dude? That's cool. But he can, he, he could hear everything on stage. So he's very astute musically without having the musical uh, accolades of being a, a scholar, a musical scholar. Gotcha. That's cool. What is the creative process like with him? Like when you guys are making songs in P-Funk, is he the mm -hmm. main creative force or is it more collaborative with, with you guys? It's both. It's, it's some, sometimes you'll have a track, I'll make a track and I'll go in and he'll record with it. Or sometimes we'll be in the studio and we'll come up with a part. Sometimes we'd be on the road and he'll send you to a studio somewhere that's a remote remotely close to where you are, whatever it is, and you put your parts, so you do you do a track, you uh, take the band in and you uh, compile the track with the band. Hmm. Um, it was different all of the time. A lot of the times that we did music and track stuff, he wouldn't be there, but a lot of the times that he did, he knew exactly where to fit in and what to do and whatnot. So he, he's uh, very down to earth, very, easy to work with unless I didn't make it easy. For us. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So do you have any, uh, like, I'm sure over 30 years, like, do you have any funny stories of the band that stick out to you when it comes to Parliament Funk? Got away for, Pardon me? Got away, for, got away for the book. <laughs> fair enough, man. Fair enough. Got away for the book. Fair enough, bro. Fair enough. So when you're recording your guitar parts, a lot of guitar players like to double their guitar tracks. Right, they'll record the same thing twice, they'll layer it on top of each other. Uh, do you mm. prefer that, or do you prefer just recording it live off the floor and then whatever you get is whatever you get? When you're in the studio, it's pretty much going to be uh, spontaneous. But what I like to do is to write and then bring something into the studio so that I knew what I was doing by the time I went into the studio mm. and spend that less amount of time trying to figure out what you're trying to do with uh, $120 an hour studio, you know, you mm -hmm. kind of want to have your shit together so you can get yeah. out of there <laughs> in, a, in a reasonable amount of time. So, mm -hmm. no, totally. When you're playing live with the band, is there a lot of improv improvising or uh, do you guys try to stick with the recordings? Like, what's the, what's the live feel when you guys are performing? That goes with the question that you asked me earlier because there were some times where we we work out a show and it was verbatim, but there was a couple of periods where we did some tunes and then we do some impromptu shit. We like rock out or jam on a bunch of stuff. So that's why it's hard for me to separate the two because I enjoy both of those, both of those periods. For you personally, what's the most gratifying part of being a guitar player? What, 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 what does it give you? Like, what do you get out of that? The joy of knowing that the audience likes something that you do, something that you created, that you bring from your person to them. I mean, to watch a, a, a auditorium, coliseum, whatever it is, people go absolutely mad after you play a solo or you get well wishes after the show. There's, that's the absolute get off with playing music for me. That's the reason why i i do this over playing music the love for people enjoying what you do is that's that's a special high for me so you know when it comes to hendrix and page and beck and van halen like there there have been so many amazing guitar heroes but since those days there hasn't really been a guitar hero so to speak like nobody uh -huh. that's like really kind of just taken this the foreground of music and just owned it as a guitarist um, do you think it's possible for there to ever be like guitar driven music at the forefront again, or are those days over? What do you, what are your thoughts on that? Okay. This is how I, I kind of look at that. There are too many great guitarists now. Hmm. I mean, I'm looking at YouTube and any, anything, any musical platform that I can. And I'm seeing all kinds of guys that are just like, miles beyond and blazing trails and and just 
shit that blows my mind. But the thing that hasn't happened is the kind of exposure that those guys that we talked about before uh, have gotten. Hmm. You know, you you feel that at all, or that's yeah. that's all I think. Yeah, no, I, I know what you're saying. It's now there it's there are a lot. There are a lot of badass guitar players, and they don't get credit. The music industry is not set up for that kind of anymore. If you catch my drift. Yeah. I, I get it, because right now, like, with the internet, it's easier than ever to get your music out there. But prior to the internet, because it was just basically the labels, if you get on a label, you automatically have more focus on you only. You know what I mean? Yes, so yes, yes. It's a double-edged sword. That's the problem. Yeah, and it's funny, because it's, it's time now. Everybody has got their um, own audiences, per se that came after the record deal. It was the, the whole thing with the record companies that changed it. When record companies, everybody went digital after CDs and all of that stuff, and people started getting their own records out and having the home studios, yay! Oh. And uh, I think that's when things, they blew up. I think they actually blew up. And there are a, tons of artists that are out there. I'm constantly looking at guitar players that are just like, bad ass i was like wow why come you don't get no you know more play or whatever it were and i guess it's the nature of the business it's more of a following thing now mm. than it is uh uh a record label pushing you you know what i mean a record label is pushing you they're putting their money behind you and they're pushing you and you get it that way it's there are a lot more there's a lot more artists out there yeah i think i think the point about the following is really important because you know in my view i think that today unfortunately like how popular you are online means much more than your actual musicianship in terms of what the labels are looking for because <laughs> it's because because of the internet i mean there's other factors but because of the internet everything goes so quickly so why if you're a label spend time developing an artist when you can just get someone that's really popular and you know automatically you're going to get a certain amount of traction with whatever you put out there. And, and, and there it all follows within that. So, I mean, and there it is. Yeah. I mean, I think what would be really cool is if, let, let's say, someone who's really big starts to go more towards the guitar driven stuff, that would influence others, like the younger generation, to kind of get back into that. I want to be clear that I don't have any beef with music that isn't guitar driven i don't think you have to be guitar driven i understand yeah, but, i understand but it would be cool to see more of that back you know what i mean like that would be really cool to get that back i in agree there. yeah i i agree i i wish you know you don't see people on on shows uh after prince after prince should, is it fair to say because he got even with his own because he he got his own platform as well Right, he he yeah. got away from uh, the the record labels and he started pushing his own stuff and still coming on TV doing his songs and whatever it were. But by that time, he had been on the record label, so you know it, it carried over. I think that it carried over. But I agree with what you're saying. Yeah, uh, I think like Prince him. slash like that was kind of like you know I mean Zach Wild, but Zach Wild is also from the '80s too. I mean, yeah, I think like post. 90s really I, I there hasn't really been like that one like trailblazing like guitarist in the mainstream like you said there's been a ton online and in other places i totally agree with that but it'd, it'd be nice to see someone that's like a like a trailblazing guitarist get back into like the billboard top 40 or something so hopefully one day that can happen you know what i mean but uh i'm hoping so i'm really hoping so i haven't seen it yet but i definitely am hoping so what do you think has to change for that to to that for that to happen oh that's a good question um <clears throat> perhaps the business itself might have to change and i don't i don't want to say regress and go back to what it was but something like what it was where they're taking acts under their wings or or musicians under their wings and putting the money behind them and uh catapulting them as for lack of a better word so that they have that exposure mm. because exposure is is pretty much where it's at yeah you know exposure is pretty that's pretty much where it's at i mean word of mouth is good but exposure yeah for sure i think i think the thing too that's kind of like it's really an interesting phenomenon is you'll have certain artists who will literally get like hundreds of millions of views on youtube and whatnot 
within a couple of years. And then they're kind of forgotten about after that. So it's like you're really seeing like a lot of artists become super famous and then just vanish. And that's, that's really an interesting thing to notice, you know? So that's what's a shame. Yes. Yeah. That's that's what's a shame. Yeah. I agree with you on that. Yeah, yeah it's it's like that. I mean, obviously like those <clears throat> artists are always gonna have somewhat of a following, but it's just you don't they don't really carry the long term weight that a lot of the artists did before. There are still new artists that have that, but I, I find that per, it seemed to me at least that back in the day it would take longer to get famous, generally speaking, but you'd keep that fame for longer. Now you can get famous really quick, but then it kind of goes quick. So Flash in the pan, yeah. Yeah. If you were starting out as a guitar player today, how would you approach things? Wow. Number one, just make sure I'm at the top of my game. Everybody's got a home studio, so... Mm. I, I'd probably go the uh, the home studio route. I don't know, like you said, anybody that's getting signed. So getting signed is <laughs> what's what's that? Hmm. For you personally, looking back on your career, is there any one thing you've done that you're most proud of? I'm proud of a lot of my career. Uh, one thing, I haven't done it yet. Hmm. I haven't done it yet. That's the fourth goal. The fourth goal is to um, emerge as a solo artist and that's cool, and persevere and you know, do my thing, do my thing. In general, in your view, who is the most important funk artist ever? Is there is it possible to pick one? I'm gonna say for me, George Clinton. That's cool. He's a funk artist. Yeah. To me, dude, they bought it. Mm. They. They brought it. There are so many different elements of players. You got blues, you got rock, you have the horn players who were actually jazz, predominantly jazz players, but they brought that flavor into the funk. Hmm. So P Funk could do anything. I mean, listen to uh, the Flash, the Flashlight album. There's just so many different kinds of music that come that came from out of there. That is just incredible mm. you were in parliament funk for 30 years that's a long time is there any one period of time during those years that sticks out to you the most and if so why wow the whole thing was somewhat an adventure to put it to you this way there were three goals that i set in my life mm -hmm. you know when you're 18 everybody most people yeah set these three goals one was to play with herbie hancock the other was to play with miles davis and the other was to play with Parliament Funkadelic. That's awesome. So I probably listened to P-Funk more than anything. And I listened to everything quite a lot. Yeah. But P-Funk probably more more so than anything else. So that was where I, where I felt I would go. To sound like an old man, the whole thing was a gas. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, dude. <laughs> Uh, there were up periods, there were down periods, uh, in the middle periods, but the whole thing was an experience and, and to do it with one of the bands that you treasure the most, that, that was an experience. That's that, was, awesome. that was a great ex experience. You recorded a ton of records with the band. Is there any one that you like the most from your P-Funk uh, discography? There are probably four. There are three, um... The title of the album was Dope Dogs, and okay. there's a there's an English version, there's a European version, and there's a Japanese version, and so, some of them have a lot of the same songs, but they all have different songs on each one of those albums. Okay. So, um, that was one of my favorites, and Dog Star, or I called it Fly On. Later on, George called it um, Fly On. That would be on P Funk Army, Guitar Army meets Jimi Hendrix. That's cool. That Thanks. was my uh, tribute to Jimi Hendrix, was a song called Fly On. And about sometime later, George put it on uh, one of the Dope Dog albums. So that, that was my favorite experience in the studio. You've had a long career, a lot of accomplishments. How'd you get into music? What is your story? Well, my parents were pretty much musically inclined. So the beginning of my musical adventure came from them listening to records when I was a kid. 
My dad plays uh, tenor saxophone, and my mom sang quite well. She was a choir singer. Oh, that's cool. And uh, Pop played in the church band. So they were both very musically inclined. Pop had a very extensive jazz collection. And mom was into Sam Cooke and all of the uh, the soul stuff, I guess we called it yeah, at yeah. that time. So around, I'm thinking around six or seven we started going to see our relatives in Fresno, where That's my cool. uncle, LG, had a guitar. And as told by my parents, mm -hmm. they said every time we went up there to visit, I would always run over next door to LG's house and get the guitar and start That's playing awesome. on it. So the rest uh, is history. That's so cool, man.